good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, John Worth. Um, I'm actually an alumnus of the College of Europe, and it's a pleasure to be back here in Bruges um, talking about uh, European Union politics. Um, the topic of my speech today, as you see it on the slide uh, over here to the left, is uh, why you are not a pro-European. Um, I'm trying to kind of lay down a challenge to all of you uh, here in this room. By this I don't mean you should abandon your belief in the European Union being a good thing or the European Union being somehow useful. I think you should just stop calling yourselves pro-Europeans and I'm going to try to explain why that is so. When I was a, just after when I finished as a student at the College of Europe in 2004, I started writing a blog about European Union politics and at no point in the now 10 years of writing that blog have I referred to myself as a pro-European. And I've learned some things along the way, and I'm going to try to explain some of that uh, in the court over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, you can also debate about this on, um, um, on Twitter. You can download the slides, and equally there's also a live stream here for those people uh, watching online um, as well, internet permitted. So, I'm going to start with the leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, the Liberals in the European Parliament, uh, the, the uh, Belgian uh, politician uh, Guy Verhofstadt, who said in 2013, the pro-European forces should unite against Euroscepticism. Um, I don't actually agree with Guy Verhofstadt. Right? I'm a Green, he's a Liberal. Um, why should I necessarily unify against the forces of Euroscepticism? There are plenty of people who consider themselves to be pro-European who are much, much further to the right party politically than I am. I have very little in common with those people, other than the fact we have some kind of belief in the European Union in some shape or form. Euroscepticism comes in many different colours. It's uh, from the left, it's from the right, it's nationalist, it's socialist. Um, why do we have to fall into the same trap when we have to be unified as pro-Europeans if the opposing side is so disunited? In Germany, it's been a bit the same. Guido Westerwelle, the former German foreign minister, the, the, pro, the solution for our current problems is not less, but instead more Europe, he said, uh, back in 2012. And then he changed it a bit in 2013, saying, it's not always just about more Europe, we want to build a better Europe, whatever that means. Um, we would not argue about any other political system in the same way. Now, I'm not in favour of more Berlin, or more London, or more Landtag of mecklenburg vorpommern or less. Whereas we seem to find it's fine to talk about the European Union in that way. We don't even talk about other international organisations in terms of more or less either. We very seldom hear the argument we want more NATO, or more OECD, or something of that nature. Yeah? So why do we fall into that trap when it comes to talking about the European Union? We're always talking about more or less, that can also then lead to the discussion, particularly in my home country, the UK, in versus out, and this frame which is pro-European versus Eurosceptic. As far as I see it, trying to argue about the European Union in those terms is essentially a dead end. It leads you into some very strange places. Here is the uh, former Finnish Prime Minister, now a European Commissioner, Jyrki Gatainen, someone who has in classical terms kind of classic pro-European credentials, <laughs> He said in January, three days after the Greek elections, we don't change our policy according to elections with regard to the future of the Eurozone. Does that mean that being a pro-European has no space in that definition for a politician like Yanis Varoufakis, the Greek uh, um, finance minister, or importantly, looking into the future with the Spanish election on the horizon for someone like Pablo Iglesias from the Podemos movement in Spain? Is there no notion that these individuals here yeah, that don't fall into the kind of classic, the classic Brussels view of pro-Europeanism but these people are indeed in favour of the European Union, they just want to see the European Union behaving in a rather different way, according to their particular national context, admittedly. What about other things the European Union does? How many of you in this room are big fans of the way the EU's common agricultural policy works? <laughs> but what is a conservative view of a common agricultural policy, right? That's probably the one we've got at the moment, to be frank or a social democratic view of it, a liberal view, or a green view. How do we ever express that? Those of us that want to defend the European Union very often try to actually, in the end, we are forced into defending 
what the status quo is, rather than actually making a case for how we want the European Union to look into the future and what changes we would like to be able to see. So it's fair to be a, for me to be a green European and to argue the changes in the common agricultural policy on that basis. We instead have formal European Union communications that look a little bit like this. This is a poster that appeared at Gar Luxembourg Station in Brussels uh, back in 2010 from the information office of the, um, uh, for Belgium of the European Commission. It said, the top line says, this is all as a result of the European Union, all, all, all the um, uh, short, the um, responsibility lies with the European Union. It then has a series of things that the European Union theoretically could be responsible for. The financial crisis, uh, finan uh, the social exclusion, the crisis in the automobile industry and the crisis in the milk um, 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 market. And then it says, get rid of your received ideas, come and visit us at the European Information Centre to be put straight on those points. Now, there's nothing in my view in any of those points that should necessarily make you critical of the European Union. The European Union bears some responsibility for some of the aspects of the financial crisis, but it should be perfectly possible to be in favour of the European Union while at the same time also being critical of the way that the financial crisis has been handled. Second, this is an awful advertisement because it actually sets up the argument in the wrong way. It basically plays into people's um, uh, prejudices about the European Union and then tries to reverse them. That is what pro-Europeans have been doing for years, has basically been saying, whatever you think about the European Union, trust us, it's not right and the truth is this rather than actually saying, this is what we want the European Union to do and how we want it to be communicated. That's why you have campaigns like the ACT, REACT, IMPACT campaign that was run for the European Parliament elections. The EU institutions communicate in a way that is lacking in political content because they've forgotten to be able to make those political arguments in an ideologically driven way. You just have to be told the European Union is important, not necessarily the reasons why it matters to you as an individual person. We also have the situation, again, particularly in the UK, where much of the communication about the European Union is driven as a result of the debate around myths about what the European Union does. Does the European Union legislate the curvature of bananas, and should it indeed do so? We keep on spending our time arguing, well, actually, that's a myth that the European Union legislates the curvature of bananas, rather than actually asking, what sort of legislation do we actually want to have for the future of our safe um, uh, fruit and vegetables for our consumers in Europe? Or another recent one that's caused quite some controversy is the eco-design um, uh, legislation. How much electricity should a vacuum cleaner use? Now, this, is, this has been, was put on the front of the Daily Express in the UK. The European Union is coming after our vacuum cleaners. The basic idea is the European Union actually wants to legislate to reduce the amount of electricity which is used by domestic appliances. As I see it, that's a perfectly good thing. We all use too much electricity and therefore we ought to reduce it. The market itself is not producing greener vacuum cleaners, so the way it means of making the market produce more efficient vacuum cleaners is to actually legislate and say, actually, manufacturers of vacuum cleaners, you've got to improve. Now, that's the argument why I'm in favour of this legislation, but how many European Union politicians were actually willing to stand up and say, we need law in order to manage to improve the functioning of this market? No one actually dares do so. So the European Union does something good, doesn't communicate why they're reducing the electric consumption of vacuum cleaners, and then newspapers write about it that the European Union is eroding everyone's solid. And we have this, and right from the very top, Jean-Claude Juncker is just as guilty with all of, of all this poor communication as, as, as all the other politicians I've mentioned already. And he has this awful soundbite that he keeps on repeating that was actually invented by Jose Manuel Barroso in the first place. He said the, it, the, he wants an EU that is bigger and more ambitious on big things and smaller and, on, on, and more modest on small things. Right? What is an electrical standard of a vacuum cleaner? Is that a big thing or a small thing? Uh, one way is extremely tiny, right? I don't, we probably as European citizens only buy one vacuum cleaner every five years. But if you had at vacuum cleaners and fridges and laptops and projectors and television sets and every single electrical gadget that we own, 
and then consider the climate change impact as a result of the electricity generated in order to keep all of those things going, then that's actually quite an important thing. And if you believe in the single market in the European Union, yeah, you cannot legislate vacuum cleaners at the national level, you've got to do it at the European level. So let's have an argument about whether actually we want that legislation or not. This is actually Brussels shorthand for deregulation, essentially. Yeah? This is basically saying, let the market run free. Yeah? And it's dressed up in those terms instead. Yeah? It's Brussels bullshit for deregulation. Yeah. <laughs> so just be careful to be pro-European, bringing these things to a close. Describing yourself as pro-European can be seen to a certain extent as defense of the status quo. It's defense of the type of European Union that is wanted by people like Jean-Claude Juncker or Guy Verhofstadt. People who've been born and brought up in the kind of European Union of the 1980s and 1990s, the kind of law generation. We need new and alternative visions for how the European Union works, and we need to be able to be more relaxed about political difference within that and be able to be willing to, to communicate it. Being pro-European can also be seen, and this is quite a dangerous one, as creeping post-democracy. By that, and that's what I refer to with the, 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 the quote that came from Yoki Katainen. Yes, of course, Greece made legal commitments with regards to its, its debt and the future of the Eurozone. But nevertheless, if the European Union says, well, actually, we are not going to change our policies as a result of the Greek election, and there is no democratic control of what those Eurozone um, uh, rules are through the European Parliament and through European Parliament elections, there is the danger that saying you're pro-European is basically in defence of a supranational technocracy, and that is not a place where politically that I want to be. And the biggest danger of all is being pro-European is using your opponent's frames, right? Every time anyone talks as a pro-European, that plays straight into the Eurosceptics' hands, because basically that frame works for them, because they do not have to be coherent, they can attack the European Union in as many different ways as they wish. And so therefore, if we keep on looking at the European Union as a pro-European versus in a Eurosceptic way, then that plays straight into the hands of people like Nigel Farage, and we need to think of our communications in a different way. So to draw this to a close, don't describe yourselves as pro-Europeans, describe yourselves as green Europeans, liberal Europeans, social democratic Europeans, Christian democratic Europeans, whatever you wish. But try to avoid just using this lazy, old, tired, pro-European versus Eurosceptic frame. So that is all from me. Uh, thank you very much indeed.